And Micah, thank you guys so much once again. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Awesome, cool. So as Chris said, we, yes sir. Okay, all right. <clears throat> We're having a little bit of a technical, technical difficulty, so hopefully we'll be getting some slides here very shortly for you all to see, but this is going to be a study on uh, apologetics. And so uh, we actually, I, I stole the name from Jake Grant, who's there in the back. We, uh, we did a nice CTV show a couple years ago now um, about the Apostle Paul. And we were just discussing uh, some of the scripture with the Apostle Paul and how he's so commonly misunderstood. And the name kind of stuck. Um, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be getting some getting some slides up and uh, be able to talk here about about apologetics so essentially what we want to talk about with Paul is just how there's so many different versions of Paul being taught and, and preached and, and discussed today you know we have the church is creating doctrines essentially from his letters and isolating little snippets and verses and creating whole theologies on them then we have those who are tossing him out. If you've been in this Torah movement long enough, you'll see that many people are saying that he's a false prophet, and they're just completely discarding Paul and throwing him away completely. Then there's those who are a lot like I was and, and maybe stuck right in the middle and, and not really sure what to do with them. Um, so I think, it's I think it's important that we really dig into Paul's writings and we study him for who he is. And there we go. We got some slides up on the screen. And uh, hopefully I get a little, you got to just click through, or you got a clicker for me, or perfect. They're going to get me a little clicker here, and we'll go through with, uh, with Paul. Um, so essentially, apologetics, where we got this name, comes from the actual word apologetics, which is a Greek apologia, which means speaking in defense. It's a discipline of defending religious doctrines through systematic argumentation and discourse. In the classical Greek legal system, the prosecution delivered what was called a categoria, and the defendant replied with an apologia. So we're going to put Paul on the stand today. We're going to let him defend himself with his own words instead of the words of the accusers who are kind of saying that he is this false prophet. So let's put Paul on the stand today and, and let him defend himself. So that's kind of where we get this name, Apologetics, from. And while we're uh, waiting for the... Um Quicker. I just wanted to say good morning myself, and uh, it's good to see you all here. It's been fun to connect with different ones of you, and uh, it was really fun doing the beach chat last night. I wish we would have had about an extra hour uh, to continue talking there, but <clears throat> looking forward to this. I wanted to let you know, though, I, uh, I've been cramming for this one because I wasn't prepped for this one, so forgive me if I stumble along the way as we go forward. This was, as uh, Chris said, this was Darren and Zach's last year, and I'm joining Zach this year because Darren can't be here. So apologetics, <clears throat> defending the writings of the Apostle Paul, as I mentioned. We want to have a full understanding of the context, the culture, the language, and the audience that Paul is going to be addressing. So who exactly was Paul writing to? What were those people facing at that time? And why is it even important? You know, I had someone say to me once, Zach, you do too much digging into the scriptures. You do too much digging into the history and the context. The Bible is written in a way where it should just be able to transcend all time. I should just be able to pick it up, read it, and fully understand the message through the Holy Spirit. And while, yes, that's absolutely and completely true, the Holy Spirit does lead us and, and speak to us in those ways, we still need to understand the context of what's going on. Mic up closer. <clears throat> we still need to understand <clears throat> the context of what is going on for us to be able to, to understand Paul and understand who he really is. So we're going to use Paul to defend the word of God instead of using Paul to defend the word of man. Because sadly, that's what happens too many times in today's church. 
I think I have a broken broken clicker. So Which slide we're on we're on slide four here. So as Zach said, sadly, in today's church, many use the teachings of Paul incorrectly. Most of us have come out of mainstream Christianity, and we thought that Paul says the word of God doesn't apply, the law of God doesn't apply to us. There's over 43,000 denominations, and most are divided over doctrines which they get from Paul. <clears throat> and uh, and that's, that's a problem. So as we dig through this, we're going to see a little bit different perspective on that. So as we move on to the next slide here, um, we're going to be talking about how the fact that we live in this microwave, fast-paced, on-demand society where everything is instantly downloaded, we can stream everything, we can do a Google search of everything, and automatically get it at our fingertips, we become somewhat complacent. We become somewhat lazy in the way that we study and the way that we research, especially when it comes to the scriptures. So for example, when we were putting this presentation together, what we did was we Google searched scripture that says, scripture of Paul that says the law is done away with. And you wouldn't believe the amount of hits that a Google search would bring up when you type something like that in. It was the third or fourth one down that we clicked on. It was 37 arguments of why the Apostle Paul says the law is done away with. And we based a lot of those arguments in this presentation here. So we're going to hopefully talk a lot about what those arguments are and how we can defend those arguments or how we can let Paul defend those arguments for himself. Because as we move on to slide number six here, the first thing that we'll hear when we discuss the Torah, the instructions of God, when we discuss that his commands are good for us today, the first words out of people's mouths usually are, Zach, but Paul said... We no longer need the law now that we have grace after the cross. Or they'll say something like this. But Paul said, we are free from the law. But Paul said the writings are something that we don't need anymore. The law, the commands, the instructions are things that we no longer have to follow. It's sad to see that the writings of Paul are used to establish and defend lawlessness and to create dispensational doctrines. Just a quick note on dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a religious interpretive system for the Bible. It considers biblical history as divided by God into different dispensations. Defined periods or ages to which God has allotted distinctive administrative principles. According to dispensationalist theory, each, each age of God's plan is thus administered in a certain way and humanity is held responsible as a steward during that time. So can you believe that? That we're actually taught that God breaks up the way that he deals with different people in different ways? You know, I would hate to have been the people before the cross that had no chance because they were under that time period. It just doesn't seem like that's the God that we serve. But Paul also says this, Micah. We are, uh, we no longer, no, nope, it didn't switch. It's, uh, the law is holy. The commands are holy. However, I admit to you, that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. So we're seeing here there's a much different, there seems to be two Pauls. So as we go through this, how, how do we interpret Paul? Do we use the Torah, the instructions of God, or do we use our understanding of Paul? And we're going to work through that as we continue to move forward here. So which Paul is it? You know, with our current understanding... We have two options. Best case scenario, Paul is double-minded, which scripture still speaks very strongly about someone being double-minded. Worst case scenario, Paul is teaching lawlessness and is a false prophet. We're hoping that this study will shed some light on the true Shaul of Tarsus and how he is neither double-minded or a false prophet. So as we move on to slide nine, we're going to see something about Peter's warning. See, Peter knew Paul. Peter lived in the culture that Paul lived in. Peter spoke the same language that Paul spoke. Yet he still delivered a very strong warning to those who were going to be reading Paul's writings. We need to understand that we have this 2019 mindset of Paul. And we need to put ourselves back in a biblical, Hebraic mindset of Paul when reading his writings. Peter said the following. So in slide 10... 
Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability." So, highlighting some of these things, we see they're ignorant and unstable. And what are, their, what are they ignorant and unstable in? Their understanding of the scriptures. And at that time in history, they didn't have the New Testament. So what were the scriptures? It was the, old, it was the Tanakh, the Old Testament. <clears throat> we also see the error of lawless men. And, and key word, lawless. And, and the, the mainstream church has tried to say, well, that doesn't have to do, that's only the moral law. But we'll look further into that as we continue going. And, and what is our foundation? Our foundation, we start with the beginning. Genesis is the foundation, and we move forward from there. Yeah, so as we move on to the next slide here, as Micah mentioned, the error of lawless men. So what does it mean to be lawless? Here's what the words of Yeshua have to say about lawlessness. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, everyone who makes a practice of sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So if Peter's warning to us is that if we twist Paul's writings and we might get caught up with the error of the lawless, well, what's the opposite of the lawless? It's those who are walking in the law, those who are walking in the instructions. So like I said, as we move on to slide 12 here, that we have two choices with Paul. Best case scenario, he's double-minded. Worst case scenario, he's a false prophet. And this is what the scriptures say about a false prophet. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, this is from Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that, tell, uh, that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you should purge the evil from your midst. And so we see here that this, this prophet, you know, we in our society, we think, well, we don't worship false gods. But if we're, if we're not obeying scripture and what, what God has commanded us to do, well, we're following somebody else. And, and what is the, the, the meaning of worship is, is the true meaning is obedience. You believe and you obey. So in a sense, we are worshiping another God. So Peter is saying that those who are twisting Paul's writings are becoming lawless. And scripture tells us that a false prophet is someone who teaches lawlessness then Peter is trying to warn us that Paul is not the someone that we're making him out to be. So let's take a look at who the Hebrew apostle Paul of Tarsus really is. See, the church views him as some Roman educated man, but he is very learned in the scriptures. So let's take a few minutes to learn the real Paul. And we're going to take a look at when we first see Paul or Saul in scripture. So in Acts 7:58 it says, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So obviously this is speaking of Stephen, like it says there on the screen. Then in Acts 8, 1 through 3, it says, And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, uh, Samaria except the apostles. The devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. 
But Paul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So how ironic is it, the fact that the very first time we see Paul, he is falsely accusing Stephen of teaching a lawless Jesus, a lawless Yeshua, someone who came to change the laws of God. The same thing that we do to Paul today. I just find that so ironic there. And I just wanted to quickly throw in Acts 6.13 tells us, says they put forward false witnesses who said this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. So the scripture tells us they were false witnesses. Stephen was falsely accused. Absolutely. So who is this Paul of Tarsus? See, Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, as he calls himself. And he was persecuting followers of the way. We see that he says the following, <clears throat> I am a Jew born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. If you have a Bible, underline that in Acts 22. He was according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. Being zealous at, for God is all you are this day. I persecuted the way to death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as high priests of the whole council of the elders can bear witness. From them I've received letters to the brothers and journeyed toward Damascus to take those who were, who were there and bring them to bonds in Jerusalem to be punished. So we have this false dichotomy of Paul in the, main, in the mainstream church. We're kind of taught that he was this Jewish man who became a Christian, when really that couldn't be farther from the truth. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, following the man-made oral law and the oral traditions of, as he says it himself, his fathers. See, he went from somebody who was following the traditions and the ways of his fathers to a man who was following the way of his heavenly father. And that's the same thing that we've all encountered, that we've been following the traditions of men and are now following after our Heavenly Father. We know this because Paul encounters Yeshua, the Word made flesh, on the road to Damascus, and then he goes to Ananias, a devout man of the law, to study. If Jesus came to encounter Paul, to take him away from the law of God, why would he send him to Ananias, a devout man of the law, to fully learn? See, that's what our Messiah came to do. He came to fully teach, to make full, to make fully known the instructions of God and how they should be written on our hearts and how we should not be checking the boxes of man and the traditions of men and superseding them from the instructions of our God. For us to fully understand this, we need to understand exactly what Paul was dealing with at that time, which was a lot of Gnostic and Gnosticism in the ways in these religions that were coming up in the first century. And then we're also going to talk about this guy by the name of Marcion, who really strongly influenced our church today, um, even though he was someone who was very outside of, of the laws of God. So what we do with Paul is we create what's called a straw man argument. A straw man argument is defined as this. It's a common form of argument and is an informal fallacy based on giving the impression of refuting an opponent's argument while actually refuting an argument that was not even presented by that opponent at all. One who engages in this fallacy is said to be attacking a straw man. The straw man we've created is this, the laws of God. When in reality, Paul is speaking against man-made laws, Pharisees, Gnosticisms, and other religions that are taking place at that time. He's not going from Judaism to Christianity. So when we're attacking the fact that Paul is talking against the laws of God in his, in his writings, we're creating a straw man argument because he is enforcing the laws of God as we're going to see here. So what Gnosticism is, and again, this is just a quick background to give us an understanding as we dig through Paul's letters, we're going to see how Gnosticism starts to creep in. So Gnosticism is from the Greek word uh, Gnostikos, which means having knowledge. Some of the core beliefs, and you'll find these are really interesting, are all material is evil and the non-material spirit realm is good. We're going to see that pop up a number of times. There is an unknowable God who gave rise to many lesser spirit beings called aeons. One evil lower spirit being is the creator who made the universe, and Gnosticism does not deal with sin, only ignorance. To achieve salvation, one needs to get in touch with secret knowledge. Again, we're going to see Paul uh, discussing a lot of these things here. 
And again, I just wanted to touch really briefly on this, this guy, Marcion of Sinope, because he is someone who rejected the Old Testament, and he followed a very limited Christian canon. His teachings clearly resemble that of Gnostic texts. And listen to what he preached, and tell me this doesn't sound a lot like the mainstream church. He preached a radical difference between the God of the Old Testament, who was an evil creator of the material universe, and the highest God, which is the loving spiritual God, who is the father of Jesus, who had sent Jesus to earth to free mankind from the tyranny of the quote-unquote Jewish law. Does that not sound like it? Even though we might not admit that we once believed something similar, didn't we always say something like this? Man, I'm so glad I didn't have to follow that law, and I didn't have to follow that God who created those harsh ways. But now I have Jesus. Now we have love. Now we have freedom. Even though we don't realize that we've created this false dichotomy back and forth between the Old and the New Testament, and it comes straight from these teachings of Marcion. So let's dig a little bit into the letters of Paul here and talk about Paul said what? what? <laughs> because oftentimes when we hear Paul's writings and we put it in context, that's the face we're going to be making. That's the face we're going to get. Because when we really start to understand Paul, man, it changes the whole dynamic of how we view Scripture. And again, this isn't about being right. This isn't about winning arguments. This isn't about having knowledge. This is about having a relationship with our Creator. This is about walking as Yeshua walked. And having this understanding is going to cause us not to trip when people put the speed bumps in front of us. It's going to allow us to share this better with our friends and our families when they present us with actual questions. So we need to understand Paul's writings a little bit more. So let's dig into some of the most commonly misused Paul quotes. So, whenever you tell people, you know, this is, this is what happens, you know, when you talk to people about, that you, you know, you want to keep the Torah, the whole Word of God. You get this kind of a response. It's a very strong response. You know, I don't know if it's because bacon tastes so good, or if it's because the spirit of tradition is so strong. I'm not sure what it is, but that is a, a big response we get. And then there's some people who, maybe they they understand this, but they don't understand the rest. Because I, I, I have some people in my life that do understand the food laws, but they don't understand everything else. And, you know, what Zach said about knowing how to share, um, I had an experience where I shared with somebody, and I, it was brand new to me, it made sense to me, but I didn't know all of this. And they were throwing all these, these questions at me and all these things, and I didn't know how to respond. So what did I do? I got angry because I couldn't respond properly. And knowing what we're discussing here today helps a lot as we're sharing because we don't lose our cool. We know step by step how to explain it. Yeah, so typically that food, it just it gets people so upset. I, I, I just can't believe you bring up food, and, and it's not even telling somebody that, hey, you can't eat that, or we're not supposed to eat that, but it's the fact that, you know, we might be out to eat, and I'll ask to remove something from my dish or my plate, and the person sitting across from me says, you just did what? Why would you take that bacon off of that? Or why would you not get this appetizer? And if you say it's for a health reason, they're like, oh, that's awesome. You're like, it's good for you looking to get healthy. But the second you say that you're trying to be obedient to God, even though they might have a relationship with God and go to church, they freak out. And I, I just can't, I can't seem to understand why we're okay with being healthy, but we're not okay to being obedient to God. And we see in Leviticus 11, it lays out clearly what, are, what animals are clean, okay to eat, what animals are not. And it's, we're going to talk about this later, but it's just hard for people to understand that that's our guide for what we can and can't eat. There's no other place in Scripture that changes that. So as soon as you bring up the food, you hear this, Zach, Micah. But Paul said, do not reject anything that is put in front of you. Just pray over it. Give thanks. It's from God. It's okay to eat. How many have heard that response? See, we're going to see here that what exactly is Paul talking about, and it's loosely quoted, and I'm going to say loosely qu quoted here, because that's typically what people do with Paul. They, they loosely quote. They don't actually go right into the scripture from 1 Timothy 4. So let's take a look at 1 Timothy 4 here. Now the Spirit expressly states that in latter times some will abandon the faith to follow deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. 
influenced by the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. They will prohibit marriage and require abstinence from certain foods that God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creation of God is good, and nothing that is received with thanksgiving should be rejected because it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And I think it's important to note several things in this passage here. We see that they prohibit marriage, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but where, where is, does the scripture prohibit marriage? Um, they also re require abstinence from certain foods that God has created to be received with thanksgiving. Well, where does it tell us that those foods are created to be received with thanksgiving? And, and it's, it says at the very bottom, it's sanctified by the word of God. And so that's why we threw in that slide about Gnosticism, because it's important to understand those Gnostic things. When they were denying the flesh and denying the things of the flesh, that's exactly what this is talking about here. It's talking about prohibiting things of the flesh. But if 1 Timothy, let's just pause for a second and, and, and think maybe 1 Timothy is talking about the laws of God, it would require all of this to be true. Walking in the law of God would have to be the same thing as abandoning the faith. Walking in the law of God would have to be the same thing as following deceitful spirits. Walking in the law of God would have to be devoting teachings to demons. And walking in the law of God would have to be taught by critical liars seared with conscience. Some might say that, that that's what we are, but... Walking in the law of God would mean teaching the prohibition of marriage. Walking in the law of God would mean having to do with irre irrevent, silly myths. Walking in the law of God would mean that you're abstaining from sanctified foods. Can we say that walking in the law of God are any of those things? Let's take a little bit deeper look at what it means to be sanctified by the word here. So sanctified by the word. In 2 Timothy 3.16 it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And, you know... We talked about a minute ago, what is all scripture to them at this point? It's the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, however you want to refer to that. So, Zach, if you want to... Yeah, so for something to be sanctified by the word, we have to understand what the word sanctified actually means. The definition of sanctified means to be set apart or to declare as holy, to consecrate. So how is food set apart? There's only one way. It's by the word of God. Just as the text says, Leviticus 11 tells us which food is set apart. But it doesn't just stop there. If we take a look, a deeper look into the Greek word here, broma, and understand what it means, it means food. Well, what did the people that Paul was talking to consider food at that time? If I told somebody to go into my fridge and that they could eat anything they wanted... They wouldn't eat the styrofoam container that the food was in. They would eat the food itself. The people at the time that Paul was talking to knew what food was. And it's defined for us in Strong's as just that. Food, literally or figuratively, especially ceremonially, articles allowed or forbidden by the Jewish law. So the Greek word broma is defined as food that is considered food by the standards of the word of God. So when we put this all back in context, we can see that that's exactly what Paul is talking about when he's writing to his protege Timothy. He's talking about these Gnostics who will come in and that they will forbid all food or any food that is sanctified by the word of God. That they're going to be hypocritical in the way that they teach. That they're following teachings of demons. That they're going to be liars. That they're going to prohibit from marriage. Those were all things that the Gnostics were doing at the time of Timothy. But if food wasn't a hot enough topic for you, the holidays surely will be. You can't judge me for what holidays I celebrate or when I keep the Sabbath. It's all for Jesus now. Yep. You know, we, we've all heard that. We've all heard that. And they use these verses we're going to go through in Colossians 2 to say that. But does it really say that? So yeah, exactly what was Paul talking about when he said this in Colossians 2. Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance 
belongs to Christ. So again, this is the, the most common verse that I hear when I say, I'm, I'm not going to celebrate Christmas anymore, or, or my family doesn't partake in, in, in these holidays, but we do the holy days. It's this one. Whoa, well, don't pass judgment on, on me. And it's like, I'm, I'm not passing any judgment. This is just what, what my family has, has chosen to do. But we need to understand what Paul was saying in Colossians so that we can better share this good news, this gospel with one another. We need to understand who were the people of Colossae and what were they celebrating? Is Paul condoning certain days of worship? See, Colossae was in Asia Minor, which is southwest of Laodicea, and it became a major city uh, a little bit after Paul, sometime around, or before Paul, sometime around the 5th century B.C., and it was notable for the existence of angel cult worship. This is from a Wikipedia source, so it's not even from a, from a, a Torah or a, even a biblical understanding. It was the existence of an angel worship cult. See, Paul's letters to the Colossians point to the existence of this early Christian community, the fact that the town was known for the fusion of religious influence. That means that they were combining a bunch of different religions, something called syncretism, which included Jewish, Gnostic, and pagan influences. And that in the first century AD was described as that said angel cult. So let's take a look at Colossians in context so we can really understand what Paul was saying. If we back up just a little bit to verse 8, we'll get a better understanding of this. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition. I think that's really important, human tradition. According to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So much like Timothy, there's a lot taking place here. There's philosophy, being taken captive by, by philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, and elemental spirits of the word. Big quotes around this one, not according to Christ. So if Paul's setting up for what he's going to say in Colossians 2.16, and he's starting it with what he's saying here, he's talking about things that don't have to do with Yeshua. Again, he's talking about this idea of Gnosticism, this asceticism, which is a severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgences, typically for religious reasons. That's exactly what is going on here. But let's continue in Colossians, and this is the, the verses that follow the, the famous verse of 2.16 to see exactly what Paul is saying. So let's see what it says. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from the, whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. So it's from God, it's not from man. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations of do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Refer all ascetic, asceticism practices there. Those are all ascetic practices of this severe discipline, this avoidance of all forms of indulgence. Paul is laying that out for us. So he's telling us who he's talking to. He's telling us who he's referring to, and it's this people that are blending religions together. They're taking some things of, of the holy ways, and they're blending them with the profane ways. And sadly, that's what we've done a lot of times in our mainstream church today. We've taken these Judeo-Christian background ideas of this holy law of God, but we've combined it with the worldly practices. And we want to make sure that when we jump ahead to 2.16 here, Paul isn't saying don't celebrate these days of God. He's saying when you're surrounded by everybody who is blending the ways of the world, when you're surrounded by those who are worshiping these angels, don't let them pass judgment on you for standing firm in your faith. Don't let them pass judgment on you when you say, I'm not going to eat that anymore. Don't let them pass judgment on you when you say, I'm going to stand firm and honor the Sabbath instead of going out to eat or to work to make a little bit of extra money. We know this because it says these are a shadow of things to come. The substance is Christ. Well, Yeshua, our Messiah, he is the word of God made flesh. He is the whole word and not just little bits and parts and pieces of it. So if the substance belongs to him and we're following him, 
then we're going to make sure that we are standing firm and following all these ways. And paraphrasing this verse just real quickly, um, in another version I've seen, it says, Let no one judge you in meat or drink or in respect to a feast day, new month or Sabbath, which are a shadow of the things to come for the body of Messiah. It just sounds, it, it just puts that in perspective. It's the way it's supposed to be. The way it's, it's, it's translated in most translations is, is a little confusing. So we've got two more here to go through. When, typically when I tell people, I follow the instructions, I follow the commandments of God, I get this. Well, aren't you putting yourself back under bondage? Didn't you know that Paul says this? We are no longer under the bondage of God's laws. We have grace now through Jesus. We don't have to do those things. And they're typically loosely quoting from Romans 6.14. I've bolded the verse, in con the verse in question here. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. And really it's just 614b because they kind of right. they kind of leave out the for sin will have no dominion over you part it's you are no longer under the law because you have grace so let's take a deeper look here at romans 6 so context 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 and that's going to be the number one key when we're studying the apostle paul is putting everything in context because, like Peter said, if we are untaught and we are unstable in our understanding of him, we can easily twist his words, like taking half of a sentence, and make doctrines and theologies around them. We have to know what Paul's talking about. When he says their sin will no longer have dominion over you, why is he talking about death in that same verse? Well, sin equals death. We know that because of Genesis 2.17 all the way in the beginning. It says, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat, you shall surely die. Paul also tells us that sin is entering this world in Romans 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. He's referring to what happened there in the Genesis account. Paul also tells us that sin equals death in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. And he concludes his letter with, uh, as he continues here in Romans 8, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. So again, we need to make sure that when we're reading Paul, it's not just little snippets at a time. And it's not even just chapters at a time. Because Paul was writing a letter to a specific group of people for a specific reason. There were no headings there were no chapters. There were no ways of, of, of putting us into this understanding of, of Paul but to read the entire letter in context. Because, you know, back, back when we were all in you know, elementary school and we were learning how to, how to form a letter or, or write a paper, it was you had your intro paragraph, you had your body, and you had your conclusion, right? Paul's doing the same thing. He's introducing the, the topic that he's addressing. He's writing the, the body, the substance of it, and then he concludes it. If we just take a little bit out of context, man, we could really be in for a world of hurting. So let's continue to dive into Romans 6 here. Mike is going to read for us some of the surrounding verses of 6.14. Uh, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And so we see, if we're not slaves to sin, if we're just under this grace, then we've got to be slaves to obedience and righteousness. And that, that's just not taught many so I, times. I love reading this in context because it completely changes everything about 614. So if we're not letting sin reign in our body, as Micah just said, and we're using it for an instrument of righteousness, what is righteousness? Deuteronomy 6.25 tells us that it is righteousness when we obey his commands. So if we are not under the punishment of disobedience to the law, but grace because we are following the law. So Paul also says where, grace abound, where sin abounds, grace does abound. 
That's because as we learn to walk in his ways, he's going to provide us with that grace. He's going to provide us with the understanding to continue walking further and deeper and growing in our understanding of who he is. But Paul doesn't stop there. He continues, and we'll read just a little, another little snippet here as he continues through this passage. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart, that's important, from the heart, to the standard of teaching to which you are committed, and having been set free from sin, uh, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you were once presented... Just, just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, lawlessness and more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So now we see it. We're supposed to present ourselves as slaves to that righteousness, to the truth. So what is sin? We all know First John 3, 4, because I've heard a lot of different teachers talking about that this week, that sin is lawlessness. See, the sad irony of the church and those believers who are using Romans 6 and the writings of Paul when it's saying the exact opposite. The second chance that we have through Jesus, through Yeshua, it frees us from the bondage of sin. The bondage of sin which brings about death. While we follow example of the living word, Yeshua, who was made flesh, we can walk in the righteous law, walking as he walked, avoiding sin. So the law no longer rules over us because we are no longer walking in sin. We are no longer right. destined for the death that sin had in our lives because of the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah for that. And as, as Zach and Greg touched on last night, that grace gives us the ability to walk in obedience. It's not grace to sin. It's grace so that we can walk in obedience. So we got about 10 more minutes here, so we'll try to wrap up quickly. But since we're on the topic of death, let's talk about another common one that is used. And it sounds a little bit something like this. Zach, don't you know that Paul said the written law of God is the ministry of death? And that if you follow that written law, you're destined for death. You're putting yourself back into that death penalty. Typically, they're going to be referring to 2 Corinthians 3 here. So let's read this passage. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is, as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which, uh, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So this one's a little bit more difficult, right? This one's a little bit harder to understand, even with some more of the context. Seven, now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone... That's a hard one to kind of to get, get around. What, what is Paul talking about with this ministry of death? So let's take a look at the ministry of death that Paul is talking about, going back to the Exodus account and talking about the hard hearts of the people. See, it was the people that rejected the voice of the Almighty. After he rained down his ten words, this, the gospel message that Hebrews tells us about, the people had hard hearts. We can read through the entire Torah and see that it was always a matter of the heart that God wanted people to follow the commands. It was never about the letter of the law. The people had hard hearts, and they were rejecting these instructions. Which leads us to blessing and curses. Deuteronomy 30 talks all about the fact that he is setting before us a choice. Life, if we obey. Death, if we disobey. Good and evil. He says, choose the good. Choose the instructions that you may live. That's why it became a ministry of death. The fact that the people chose death. They rejected following the ways of God. They had hard hearts and they did not want to go after his ways. So it became a written law that brought death because of our hardened hearts. See, we have that same choice, right? 
we're presented with this idea that we can accept what Yeshua did for us on the cross. We can accept what he did in his blood that was shed for us, and we can learn to live as he lived, or we can reject it. We can have hard hearts and decide not to accept that the written law of death is still just that. But he says something even more, because he says that it was the, the, the ministry of the Spirit well, won't it not have even more glory? Well, what is the ministry of the Spirit? If we look at Ezekiel 36, if we look at Jeremiah 31, we will see that he puts his Spirit within us to do what? To cause us to walk in his instructions, to cause us to walk in all of his ways, to cause us to walk in all of his ordinances. So that's why the ministry of the Spirit will do so much more, because we have the choice to choose not to be like those who harden their hearts. We have the, the choice to choose to accept the Spirit into our hearts so that it can cause us to walk in all of His ways, not by the letter of the law, but out of love and obedience for our Heavenly Father. I think it's interesting how it says in the Scripture that Israel pursued a law of righteousness but did not arrive at it because they did not pursue it by faith but as by works. And, and they stumbled over the stumbling stone. So as Paul concludes, the law does kill because it causes us to recognize our sinful nature, which drives us to kill our flesh. The desires of the flesh, which drives us to repent and bury that old man. So the letter is a good thing because we have to die to be born again. So finally, this is our last one here. And it's, it's one that is, is sadly said all too often. And it's the fact that if we go back to the law after embracing faith, it makes one cursed and foolish. And typically, this is Galatians 3 that they're paraphrasing. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Oh, you foolish Galatians, how dare you go back to that silly old law? Well, what's Paul really talking about? He's talking about works of the law. But he mentions, did you not receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing by faith? If you happen to stumble upon the uh, presentation Greg and myself did yesterday, we talked all about faith and the fact that it cannot produce, that works cannot produce more faith. No matter how many works we do, it's not going to make us have a deeper faith. Just like Abraham was called out, he was a called out one first, then he was given instructions, and then he chose to obey Paul is talking about the same things. These foolish Galatians who think that by works of the law that they're going to gain more or grow more in something. We know that Paul is not talking about zero works at all because Paul was also friends with James. And James talked about the same thing. What good is it, my brother, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? We talked about workers of the law just a minute ago with Matthew 7. And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So if Paul is ta talking about do not be a worker of any law at all, well, he's contradicting the words of Yeshua because to be a worker of lawlessness, which is a bad thing, the opposite is to be a worker of the law, but not the letter of the law, by the spirit of the law. And we know that Paul says this because if we continue reading his writings, he tells us this, that we're going to be rewarded by our works. Romans 2, 6, Micah, if you'll read it for us. Um, I'm not having it on. Oh, here it is. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life, uh, eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So if the truth is the instructions of God, and righteousness is following the instructions of God, those who are self-seeking, meaning they're doing it of their own works and of their own will, they're not going to be obeying the truth. Because the Torah, the law of God, is always about obeying through the heart first. Same with righteousness and unrighteousness. 
we need to make sure that we have that faith first, that we're doing it for the right reasons. Because if we're doing it for any other reason except for to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, then it is all for nothing. It is all vanity, and it is all meaningless. So Paul is most commonly and most utterly misunderstood, and we know that. So let's finish just by reading a little bit more of Galatians here in context, and we'll wrap up for today. So, let's see, we ended with verse 3. Uh, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Um, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are of the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So we see that this all has to deal with faith. And that if we read Paul in context, that we will surely start to understand him a little bit more. So we're going to end with this because obviously we didn't have time to get to all of these. But if you want to take a photo or for those who are watching on the live stream to see after, there's a lot more that Paul is most commonly used out of context. And if we dig a little bit deeper to understand him, we'll definitely understand. This comes from the, the 37 scriptures that I referenced earlier today. It says, the law reveals sin but cannot fix it in Romans 3. If the law worked, then faith would be irrelevant, Romans 4. The law brings wrath upon those who follow it, Romans 4. To go back to the law after embracing faith is, quote unquote, stupid, Galatians 3. The law curses all who practice it and fail to do it perfectly. The law has nothing to do with faith. The law was a curse that Christ redeemed us from. The law functioned in God's purpose as a temporary covenant from Moses till John the Baptist announced Christ. If the law worked, God would not have used it to save us, and the law was our prison. Hopefully we'll be digging into these. Um, if you want to follow us at myhouseministries.net, and we're going to dive into these scriptures a little bit more. But I don't post these to, to you know, poke at or, or make fun because I can honestly say that this was me, that this is what I believe, and this is what I taught, and this is what I was rooted in. It, it pains me to see both sides of the coin, right? That there's so many who are holding to this and missing out on the amazing and beautiful blessings that come from obedience to our Father. But what also pains me is those who start to see this as truth and start to walk in these ways, but they become Pharisees. They become hard hearts, and they begin to poke at and make fun of and chasten and beat people over the head with their Bibles until they understand it the way they do. If we're going to have the soft hearts, if we're going to truly walk as Yeshua walked, then we need to have love for one another. Because loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourself, those are the two greatest commands. And, and so, I, would, I would just like to quickly um, let Ezekiel explain what we've talked about with Paul here, because Ezekiel is one of the prophets that most railed against the children of Israel for breaking the Torah, okay? But he says something really interesting in Ezekiel 33, 13 through 15. He says, When I say to the righteous, he will surely live, and he so trusts in his righteousness that he commits iniquity. So he so trusts in his righteousness that he commits iniquity. If you trust in that righteousness, and this is, this is I think, what Paul's trying to get at so much, that you're putting your trust in the law instead of your trust in the Messiah. <clears throat> None of his righteous deeds will be remembered, but in that same iniquity of his which he has committed, he will die. But when I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and he turns from his sin and practices justice and righteousness, if a wicked man restores a pledge, pays back what he has taken by robbery, walks by the statutes which ensure life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. So we see that if, if you walk by the statutes, which ensure life without trusting in your ability to do it, you will surely live. And that's the narrow path that Paul's trying to explain all throughout his letters. Because as Micah just mentioned, sadly, we're seeing so many in our movement and in our groups and in our own fellowships put themselves back under the law, as Paul talks about, right? They're denying their Messiah, Yeshua, 
They're denying the very spirit that led them to this truth. That's what Paul is getting at. Don't put yourselves back under the law. Don't put yourselves back under this covenant that is without Messiah Yeshua. Don't bind yourselves to something that is of naught. Because if we don't have Messiah Yeshua, if we don't have the blood of the Lamb, then we don't have anything at all. That all this becomes meaningless. So I'm going to end in a word of prayer today, and then we'll let Greg get up here on the stage. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your holy word, the word that became flesh, that dwelt among us, the word that is in us, and it is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, I pray that we would never lose sight of our first love, that we would get back to the works that we once did, and that would be to grow in our understanding of you. We thank you for the blood of the Lamb that has redeemed us and set us free from the death that we were destined for. And I just pray that for everybody here that we would never lose sight of the Messiah and his spirit that leads us to understanding. I pray for this conference and for those who are working and attending, and I'm just so thankful that we have been able to get together and to, above all, worship your holy name. We pray this in the name of Yeshua, and we say, amen. Thank you all.